Welcome to The Rabbi and the Shrink. This is Dr. Margarita Guri, The Shrink, Dr. Red Shoe, and everyone's favorite rabbi. Jonathan Goldsman. And as usual, the good rabbi has made a connection with an amazing speaker. His name is Dr. Michael Alsi, and they met during a, to a, a, a TED Talk. Uh, welcome, sir. Nice to see you guys. Well, nice to I see you. Michael. Thanks for being on. We're just, we're just delighted. Bef before the show started, I had Dr. Alsi meet my granddaughter because one of the cool things about having this podcast is we meet some very interesting spirits and minds. And I thought there was a kindred spirit. This is a grown up who does good work in the world, but has found a way to be himself, help others be themselves and have fun doing it while looking at the world differently and teaching other people to do that. Uh, his title today is Containing Multitudes. I'm not sure what that means. I can't wait to find out. Um, he's living in New York. And I think it's funny, Terry Town, like he's tearing away, but he is. Um, he is a psychologist and he's got this TED talk, Working from the Inside Out from 2017. And we'll make sure we put the link when we're talking about it. I urge everyone to watch it. Uh, and I won't steal your thunder. I'll ask you about it and you can tell it yourself. But I thought that was really rather brilliant. And one of the solutions is the same as what the rabbi and I've been saying is it's how you look at things, whether they're a problem or a blessing. And so we'll be looking at that. Dr. Asi has won an award that I've never met anyone who's won. It's the American Psychological Association's 2019 Schillinger Memorial Prize. And, it ha and the, his title is The Unconscious and All That Jazz, Improvisation as the Essence of Psychoanalysis. And we'll make sure to, to ask him about that. The cool part about this is here's a guy who's having fun doing what he does. And, and Rabbi, isn't that what ethics is all about, really? Just being true to who we are? I think that um, you know, it does have to do with our relationships, ultimately. And if our relationships are not bringing joy to us, then there's something wrong. So I'm uh, I'm eager to hear uh, what you can have, what you have to tell us, uh, Dr. Alzi. Yeah, I, I think ethical dilemmas are the stuff of creative life, right? Um, we we certainly need to embrace and lean into the distance dissonances in order to create new forms, and that is exactly what gives us the joy and fulfillment. Because we're the most joyful, I think, when we're creating. If you look at it spiritually, it's like we become like gods when we create. And, and that gives us a sort of abundance, um, what Joseph Campbell said about talking about following our bliss. But ironically, our bliss often comes from dealing with the difficult stuff, embracing the difficult, the ethical dilemmas. And by having that consciousness, we can embrace the multitudes. So containing the multitudes, what is that title all about? Help us understand. So poet Walt Whitman said in Song of Myself, do I contradict myself very well then? I am large, I contain multitudes. And the ironic part is we so often get hung up on dealing with diversity outside of ourselves. When we are extraordinarily diverse inside, we have multitudes inside that we're fighting with all the time and that's usually why we also get into problems with others because they're bringing up all that stuff inside. Like I like to think about it, um, wellness is an, an ethical creativity is an inside job, that's right? True. You know, it's really interesting the way you phrase that um, because you're, you're echoing an idea that I've talked about at length, but you're, you articulate it in a way that I, I really never thought of it before. Uh, I, I like to talk about the inherent paradox or contradiction of the human condition, that we have to live short to have short-term focus to reach long-term goals. We're individuals living in a, in a society where we need other people. We're spiritual beings trapped in a physical world. But you, you articulate in terms of diversity. We are internally diverse. And in the same way that we want to celebrate our cultural diversity, because our differences make us stronger, our internal diversity is something we should celebrate. So I really, uh, I really like the way that you framed that. It's really intriguing. Thank, and you know what's 
interesting I like about it too is that you know we all talk about how we want to promote inclusivity and diversity and sometimes we don't even look at ourselves and how we can other aspects of ourselves and as we know doctor rabbi the most challenging part that people have is for exiling from themselves right I can't feel my sadness I can't feel my anger I can't feel my pride or this conflicts with some other side of me. And really learning about how to embrace diversity outside comes from learning to embrace diversity inside. So well put, and so many people are so busy trying to change who they are rather than really learning to love what they're stuck with and making it an asset. Yeah. It's, yeah, well, it's funny because, Go ahead. what's that? It's funny because, you know, in, in the Judeo-Christian, you know, we sort of can become exiled from ourselves. And in a way, we talk about marginalizing others. We can, one of the things that we know, doctor, from people coming into our offices is that most people marginalize parts of themselves. Yep. And one of the things I love about some of your work, both of you, is that you talk about how this could be really fun, getting to work on these dilemmas. Like, I love your title, Rabbi Ethics Ninja. It's like so cool. It's like you can use this to have fun with it and get your strength and power from it. And it makes me think of one of my favorite biblical stories that I wanted to share with the rabbi here is the story of Joseph and the, you know, multicolored coat. He starts with that as a gift from his father and he shows it to his, his brothers and he tells them about his dream where they're bowing down to him and they misperceive it as him being boastful. When actually he's sharing that he's connected to this wonderful gift and this light that he can embrace. And then, of course, they get jealous and throw him in a pit because they can't stay with their own lack. Their own desire to have more of what he has. And, you know, in this, this dilemma that goes on between them, you see this back and forth between how do we deal with these difficult sides of ourselves? And I love your stuff, Dr. Um, Great. I love when you talk about misbehavior. Misbehavior is misplaced desire. Yes. Misbehavior is displaced hurt and displaced um, fear. And of course, when anything is miss or dis, it's not creative. Creativity involves the symbol, which from the Greek means to throw together rather than what's diabolical, which is to throw apart. So one of the reasons I love this story of Joseph, by the way, of course, doctor, you know what's really cool about it for us as therapists. Joseph, even Freud mentioned this in the interpretation of dreams. Joseph was essentially the first therapist in, <laughs> in modern history. He analyzes dreams. He ministers to um, somebody that he meets in prison. Yes. He advises the Pharaoh. And he is, has a vision that helps people do their soul work. So I've always had a strong connection to Joseph. And one of the lovely pieces of the story, as you might know, is that when his brothers come to him later, because there's a famine, instead of taking you know, revenge or retaliation, he embraces them. And I think what we learn from that is that we all have these ethical dilemmas, but we have to work together to transcend them. There is a cartoon that was made of this story, Joseph and his coat that's very accessible for children of all ages. And when I was a child, the story was told with a lot of guilt and shame, being Catholic, we're good at this. And- We're good um, at this too. Yeah, well, yeah, you too, I mean, really. Um, but what I like about this cartoon is it talks about, with compassion, both sides of the story, all sides of the story. And it introduces this idea of that it's how we look at something that makes a difference. Rabbi, what do you think? I think you're one of the most fun minds I've met. <laughs> well, you know, I, I could spend the rest of the episode talking about the story of Joseph and interesting because it came up in our last uh, our last interview in, in a different context. But you, you honed in on one point, Michael, that what Joseph does is he goes to the brothers, and and the and the and the scripture calls him a lad or a youth. Mm. Because he was immature in his inability to understand. It's not just what you say, it's how you say it. Yeah. You have to anticipate the way a message will be received. And he lacked the sophistication to do that. And clearly he learns his lesson. 
yeah. because he's an interpreter of dreams as a counsel. And when the, when the brothers do show up, he doesn't make nice with them right away. He puts them through a tremendous amount of angst. Yeah, because he has them a little bit. He communicates to them by allowing them, and in thinking of him as a therapist, I think it's a real brilliant way of looking at it. He, he puts them in a situation where they will come to the realization of what they did wrong. And eventually that's what happens. His brother Judah steps forth and he says, I will take the place of, of Benjamin. And, and then Joseph can't hold himself back. He has to step forward. He has to reveal himself because he sees that amends have been made and that it's time to move forward. And there's this tremendously emotional reconciliation that only is possible if we're willing to recognize where we've gone wrong yeah. and be guided to understand how to address the mistakes we've made, how to correct them and how to move forward. And gentlemen, we have with us um, hidden and secret in the world of the internet, uh, Julie, your sister, your older sister, who says nice things about you, which is always nice when a sibling says nice things about you. <laughs> well, she's she not said, gonna throw me in a pit, I suppose, yeah. <laughs> I think it's better than that. Yes, for sure. <laughs> so important, Rabbi, she says, how the message is delivered. And I think who better than um, a woman whose baby brother is here with us today? Yeah, and I, I love that, that analysis of it, Rabbi, too, about that different way of the testing. And I think what's beautiful about it, too, of what you guys have been talking about as well, is that to do this work, you have to really go in, inward. Yes. And you can't take shortcuts with it. You know, both sides do interesting things to really look at, take inventory. And the other thing is like, we come in with gifts. We come in with gifts, but we also come in with things that need to be honed and developed. Yes. And that's also part of our creative work. It's not just to stay, to rest on our laurels of what we're good at or what comes naturally to us. And I think that's also what helps us get through these ethical dilemmas. Also, I think another point that you made Rabbi too is to, 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 to stay with the hurt a little bit more. We live in a culture that gets too quick to go to the hate or the outrage or the grievance, but doesn't get into the hurt. And, and I think if we follow the, you follow the hurt, not the hate, that helps us to open up into something deeper. Can you develop that a little bit? I'd like to hear more about that. Yeah, I mean, so, it's easy for us to get outraged on Twitter or Facebook or, you know, in conversations about what we're angry about or what we feel really emotional about. And usually that's a place of power because we can feel powerful and in control with anger. It's a lot harder to go into the vulnerability. And it's not that we shouldn't feel the anger, but we should use it as information to say there's something else here. Because anger covers over shame, anger covers over fear. And to the extent that we can get past shame and fear, we can start to get creative again. And then we can start to get creative with each other again. And oftentimes we push each other's buttons in hitting those places of pain, fear, and shame. But because we don't understand who I'm dealing with, because remember, I'm dealing with your multitudes and you're dealing with mine. And you don't know which character you're speaking to. You don't know which character you're hurting. You don't know which character you're shaming. So it takes a lot of inner work to be able to notice that. But also it takes a lot of inner work, Rabbi, to what you said too, which was Joseph's issue. And this is a brilliant point. Joseph didn't know how to speak to the, when he was speaking to the right audience and which audience and how to pitch it to one audience versus the other. He didn't realize that his brother would misperceive him as trying to make them feel smaller. And saying, look at me, I'm the big guy, I'm the God that you're going to bow down to. So anticipating where someone might be hurt or might be missing something is really important. In terms of practical uh, response, um, what I hear you saying is that if I feel the sense of anger, I should ask myself, why am I reacting to this this way? What does it say about me? Where is it coming from? And when I see that you're getting angry, I should ask myself, why are you responding that way? Yeah. As opposed to simply matching anger with anger. Yeah. 
for in, or indulging the feelings of anger and outrage and, and injustice to try to go deeper to get to the root. Where's this coming from? Because then we can defuse it. Is, is that, uh, doctor, would you say that's a- Yeah, uh, and exactly. Okay. Exactly. And the other thing too is, is what happens is we also have to see, usually the reason that, that issues are so combustible these days or radioactive is because they hit on a place of individual or collective trauma. And instead of us being able to talk about it, we act it out, right? And sometimes it's usually about something that's important to my identity. No matter what side of the aisle, whether it's Republican or Democrat, whether it's Black Lives Matter or, or some other group on any side of the spectrum, it's gonna hit a place of trauma. And trauma can't be talked about. Trauma has to be acted out until we can find a form for it. And what you're saying there, Rabbi, is really important that we need each other to put this into words. That's why therapy works, because we can't do this alone. That's why going to the rabbi helps. That's why going to clergy helps, because we need someone to help us put form to this through a relationship. That's how we're built as human beings. And you're right that it's important once we follow the herd, then it's almost like we have two pieces of this treasure map, and we each need to put it together to find the treasure together. And the beautiful part is then instead of being adversaries, instead of being people who are re-traumatizing each other, we are helping repair sort of tikkun olam, which is like healing the world. We are healing each other. And then we have these wonderful surprises where we discover something new about ourselves or each other. And all of a sudden we feel it. And that's what, you know, um, so the rabbi knows this and the and doctor knows this, it's an I vow moment. It's a moment of deep communion, which is one of the most beautiful moments in therapy are I thou moments. Where all of a sudden we feel individual but connected at the same time and something almost like there's a third thing in the room that links us. It's like that beautiful picture of, of God with Adam. Yeah. The interesting part is not the fingers, it's the space between. Yes. And that's the creative space. Right. And when we can transform polarization into creativity, we are not only healing it, we are creating new forms. And it takes a capacity to learn how to improvise and also know who you're playing with. Like a musician has to know, wait, what genre am I playing? And what am I playing with in the band? And am I listening as well as playing? See, and that's why I'm a misbehavior expert. Because I learned a long time ago where there is conflict or some sort of tension, there is a possibility. Because, wow. so I've worked with the military for years. And one thing I learned in dealing with them, for them, anger is often of default. Yeah. Because you have pride and shame, rather than thinking about all the feelings you're feeling, just go straight to anger. And so sometimes I'm angry and you're angry and it's boom, boom, give it the same. And yep. it takes a lot of leadership and a lot of self uh, reflection and discipline uh, to be able to look at somebody and say they're angry, I wonder why, how, how have I contributed to this or not? And then to be able to get to that next level where you can open up not only the connection to creativity within each of us, but you know that, that uh, non-touching, because it's yeah. like a synapse, there's no touching. It's, it's a, a synapse, exactly. Right? So and to get to that point. Yeah, and that's the space where it happens. And, and Rabbi, exactly. like, I think the other thing too that you, you know, they say there's the strongest person in a way. There's a Jewish phrase that the strongest man is, or strongest person really is somebody who can master their emotions. And that doesn't mean pushing them down. It means learning how to work with them. And, and this is sort of how we're built. And the other thing that I just want to give compassion for all of us is we have these things called mirror neurons, which, makes, which make us feel exactly what the other person is feeling. So we're built to feel this very quickly, but we also have to work with our neurobiology to remember, hey, wait, okay, this is bringing me into like the undertow, but I got to swim parallel to get back to shore. Don't let the undertow take you. Yeah, and you got to know what's them and what's us. So the that's time. the I, thou, but to know what's the difference. So is the anger yours that I'm picking up or is it mine? Yeah, and which, which multitude is it? Is it yours? Is it mine? Is it this overlap? Yeah, it's interesting. Wow, it's fascinating. So tell us about the introverts. Um, I think you're doing something in a space that I think will make a lot of uh, people 
sit up and notice because a lot of people in ethics are very introverted, not all of them, but many are. And I think you came up with a way of looking at introverts in a way that can facilitate anyone not only to feel good about themselves, but to move forward in a strong and creative way. So tell us about your journey with introverts. It was, it was sort of an accident, like Bob Rock <laughs> in his paintings, you know, it was like, oh, look, there's a happy tree. Um, and I was trying to form a new group in the college that I was working at. And I was like, I want to do something different. So I was like, you know, there's a lot of introverts in, that I was seeing individually. And I'm like, wouldn't it be great if they got to talk to each other and see how wonderful they are and how a lot of their anxiety and depression has nothing to do with really having a problem, just not knowing how their work or how the culture works against them. And I put up these posters that said like introverts unite um, in small groups for a limited period of some time. And my colleagues laughed at me thinking that nobody would show, but it was, I was delightfully surprised that it was the most popular group I'd ever run. It was consistent, they were engaged and they really thrived. And I saw that in individual therapy, they did so much better. And I thought, wow, it's so funny that as psychologists, we forget we have this sort of one size fits all approach. And we never ask somebody like, how do you get your energy? Do you get it by going inward? Do you get it with people? Do you get it by a combination? And you'd think that would be something like, sort of like taking a blood test for a doctor that you would do. And yet a lot of the folks coming in had this kind of shadow anxiety and depression that had nothing to do with typical anxiety or depression. And that's what I thought, wait, even though Susan Cain wrote this wonderful book, Quiet, it hasn't, it hasn't found its way into therapy circles. And I thought, well, this is interesting. And then I reflected on myself being an introverted extrovert, what we call an ambivert, and realized, oh my gosh, it makes so much sense. And so many of us therapists are introverted extroverts because we love going inward. We like that one-on-one, -on -one, but we also like the social connection. And so I thought, wow, we gotta, we gotta talk about this as a culture. Well, your uh, TED Talk talks about that brilliantly. Sorry, Rabbi, then that's where you two met on the TED Talk stage. Rabbi? Okay. Yeah, I, I heard a study where they, they played music in a, um, in, in a nursery in the hospital where infants, they were still you know, just born, newborns. And the, the, the babies that seemed to be more agitated mm -hmm. by, the, by the music, um, they tracked them and, and they typically developed into introverts. Yep. And the, and the ones that were more comfortable with the music typically developed into extroverts. And, and it was very interesting to me because I, 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 I'm in a mixed marriage. Um, my, uh, my wife's an extrovert. Uh, <laughs> I'm in a mixed marriage too. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, but you know, it's, it's, it does present some challenges because my wife will have the radio cranked up and I'm on the other side of the house thinking, can you please turn that down? <laughs> or, or we're sitting together and I'm very comfortable with silence and she feels like I'm ignoring her. <laughs> and so we, we have to work, and this is after almost 34 years of marriage, we have to work at um, remembering who the other person is and not interpreting someone else's behavior, going back to our previous conversation, based on my perceptions or my feelings, but rather understanding this person's coming from a different place. And when we do have that awareness, then we can start recognizing that they're different styles. We can start trying to, to accommodate. I can be a little more outgoing, outgoing, forthcoming. She can be a little more accepting of my my need for, for space and quiet. Uh, and, and then the, the relationship will thrive. Whereas if we are imposing our expectations on the other, then we're going to be bumping into each other quite a bit. And again, looking at the multitudes, right? We, we forget. And I love what you said too. And you know what, I want to hear the funny problem that we have. Every piece of progress is also makes us lose something. And us therapists did a wonderful thing. We taught people to look at their environment. And to say, wow, your environment really shapes you from Freud beyond. Boy, look at nurture. Look at nurture. It's so important. And what happened is we forgot about nature. And, you know, it used to be in the old days that we talk about nature a lot more, maybe to the exclusion of looking at nurture. And we need to bring them together. We are 
we are a combination of who we are as individuals with a nature and we, we we're working with a nurture to figure out how we match and again that's how we make music i think that cuts to the heart of ethics i mean ethics is about not looking at the world in a binary way so yeah. oh is it nature or is it nurture well to use a common expression duh um <laughs> Obviously, it's both. Well, that's where the, cre the creativity to, happens. We try to, you know, we try to limit it to one or the other because it just seems to make, seems to make things simpler than dealing with the complexities of having. Well, diversity is very inconvenient. It makes you think. It's Ooh. tough, Ooh. and people don't always want to think. You cancel. And, you know, in music, what's interesting too. I love what you're saying. See, we like to think about binaries, but really, interesting happens happens in threes whether it's the Holy Trinity on the Catholic side, right? Or whether it's um, like what I was talking about with the fingers, or if you look at music, it's the third of the chord that determines whether it's major or minor or anything else. The third is what gives it its color. Without that, it really can be pretty bland. The colors so, the primary colors. Yeah. So we really, we really want to chord it, but it also, it brings up tension and stress and it's not easy because we do like to go to the default of resolving things simplistically. And, you know, from, you know, Daniel Kahneman, like talking, we like to resolve things with shortcuts. And it's understandable. That's why I think being ethical, I think that's what's so important about all religious paths is they say, listen, this has to be cultivated and practiced. There is some part of this that is the default. You're born empathic, hopefully, but it has to be nurtured and cultivated. And you can't do it alone. You have to do it. The wonderful thing about Judaism too is that you have to do it within a community. That's also why you need a minion of 10 men because you know 10 men is what are needed or 10 people are needed in order to, if, if the world had to start from fresh, you need 10 people to start the world fresh again. <laughs> you know, Or in, in other words, like I mean, from, from one of the stories, I'm, I'm probably misremembering it, but, but, but there's some idea too that we can't be ethical without working together and figuring it out together. We can't do this alone. And yet we also have to be very able to look at ourselves honestly yes. with who we really are, what we really feel, what we really think, and then use others to not only bounce off to understand ourselves, because that's the other paradox of being human, as we know in our sessions, doctor, is like, in order to become fully human, you actually have to have others reflecting back. Yes. We become ourselves that, through others. I can get theological for just a moment. Um, Please. You know, when, when, it, when God created Adam, um, there's some ambiguity in the, in the verse there. It says he created them before he actually created woman. And the mystics tell us that originally Adam and Eve existed in one body. Mm. There was a male and a female face whether that's meant literally or spiritually and why was it not good that man should be alone because there has to be interplay yeah. we have to see each other and the male and the female side which represent the two different aspects of the human being they have to exist separately so that they can deal with the tension in order to come together and create a new unity and that's what harmony is. And that's why we're greater than the sum of our parts. And that's mm. why you need a society and we need other people. Because as you say, we can't do it alone. I love that. I love that. That's so beautiful. And you know what's also beautiful about it too? When Adam and Eve are thrown out of the garden, so to speak, right? It's the most terrible thing in some ways because they're no longer immediately connected to God and nature. But the beautiful thing is that then they can have a child. And then Adam can name the world. And so we see language, you know, as something of a creative act, but also the birth of a child as being a creative act. And so part of the tension of being human is that we can't be gods per se, but we can emulate and we can get close. And we can strive. And we can make something in that space that's beautiful even amidst the tension, even amidst being exiled, even amidst sometimes feeling disconnected. So one of the things I like that you're doing in your work, doctor, that's very practical, mm -hmm. 
is you look at those aspects of self that make someone introverted or different in other ways. And we look at how not to exile them within themselves or from the outside, but to ask, what is it about this person? What do they need? What do I need? What do you need? What do they need? And move forward knowing that these inconvenient differences are the, the richness. They are the blessing. They are the opportunity. And to not look at things as that's a problem, that's healthy, that's not. Obviously, in some jobs, you want introverts and in some extroverts, some ambiverts. Some jobs, uh, you want a little bit of everything. So looking at it that way, I think you've helped people go beyond being stuck with the prejudices of diversity. And think of it as one more aspect that's a secret to success. Yeah. Um... So you mean, yeah, so, so it's interesting. I was thinking as you were talking, like one of the interesting things about being fully human is to be like a jazz improviser and notice that life brings all these changes at us. So I love, you know, Mr. Rogers, a uh, young Mr. Rogers in the documentary about him, he's playing at the piano and he says, you know, I think the hardest thing, what I'm trying to do is help kids deal with the modulations of life because it's really hard to go from like C, it's easy to go from C to F, but F to F sharp, now that's a little bit more difficult. And it seems to me that you need someone to help you weave through these things. Yes. And I think, you know, in this global pandemic, we've seen it even more keenly, like what is it like to deal with major changes? And how do we approach these changes in a creative way? And also recognize the strain of it. It's sort of like that David Bowie, like turn and face the strange, like changes are not easy, but if we, we don't turn and face them, we, 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 we miss out on the opportunity to do something interesting with them. And interestingly enough, like that's a skill that I think sometimes we don't teach enough, right? In, in school or in, in the family, like that this kind of emotional improvisation is, is crucial. Like an actor who learns improv, the, the, the key rule of the cardinal rule of improv, you probably know, right? is yes and. So if you tell me that you're talking on a phone, I don't say that's not a phone, that's a hammer. I say, yes, it's a phone and I go along with it and we make something together. And the thing that helps us come through difficult changes, instead of trying to deny it or push it away, what can I do with this? How is this an invitation to deepen something in myself or with another? And it's the same with like getting to know whether you're introverted or extroverted or all the different sides of you and all the different stories in you. Because I think one of the things we forget is that we are a conglomeration of all these different stories. And these, you know, we think of ourselves as one self. So the great poet Pablo Neruda said, of the many men I am whom we are, I cannot settle on a single one. Because in fact, we are all many. And once one, when, we, when he talks about when I wanna be the hero, I am in fact the coward. When I want to be the firefighter, it turns out I'm the arsonist. And so we're all wrestling with these diverse sides of ourselves that are tricky and difficult. But once we understand how to listen to the music, we're like, hmm, which changes are coming up? And there's this great uh, jazz vibraphonist named Stefan Harris. And he did this great TED talk and he said, there are no mistakes on the bandstand. And the reason there are no mistakes is because if you're listening, you can make something interesting out of anything. Wow, that, that is absolutely beautiful. Isn't that cool? It is, it is. And I'm also wondering in terms of ethical missteps, because we're yeah. talking about miss and dis. What are your thoughts on why so many people, and I, I don't know a nicer way of saying it, become lemmings and just follow <laughs> along something that seems popular, but is truly not an ethical pretty thing. You know, it's unethical. What happens to those um, lemmings when we all can be lemmings at times? But what happens? Why, why does that happen? You know, it's a really interesting point. I, I think, again, have compassion with yourself. So the two things, I once heard uh, Tony Robbins speak at a, at a psychotherapy conference. It was a high octane performance, like usual. And But one of the things that he said that I thought was brilliant was, we human beings love two things the most. Stability and change. 
<laughs> so the stability often wins out in I'd rather go with something or rather go with some authority or something else that I can immediately understand rather than stay through the ambiguity and uncertainty. We don't like uncertainty. We don't like not knowing. We don't. And we're afraid of getting in trouble. So I see it in organizations when I'm consulting with them. People have done an uh-oh. There's an ethical uh-oh or legal uh-oh and they call me or they yeah. call someone like the rabbi or you. And one of the questions is, is the one person that speaks up is called a whistleblower rather than a leader. Yeah. And how is it that we can change cultures so that we can flow with the modulations of ethical wisdom or uh-ohs? Mm -hmm. And what is it? So how can we facilitate people having that beautiful harmony of improvisation and discord um, from jazz to every day, like the ethical the ethical jazz um, yeah. composition, what can we do? Let's say we're an individuals or we're an organization, what can we do? I think the rabbi said it really most brilliantly when we were talking about Joseph, which is we have to learn how to kind of think outside the box, like you said, and make adjustments, but we also have to know what audience we're working with and where they're at. And we need to pitch our, in other words, when you're playing with, with other players musically, you want to in, introduce new ideas, but you also want to bring out what you've heard from them and, and, and weave it in so that you can come together and, and start working. Y you know, you don't and want that in fact is one of the things we have to teach organizations that are, that are having trouble with whistleblowers. We have to change the culture so that we value someone say, hey, let's push back on that. Now that's, let's look at this in another way. Everyone is saying this, uh, is there another way of looking at it? Have yeah. we missed the point, right? Yeah. And the other thing too is remember, it's the tension with the whistleblower and the vested interest of where things are at, the status quo. And, and again, your big sister asks, why do the lemmings scapegoat the whistleblower? Because um, remember, the whistleblower is doing something creative, which is dangerous and makes us uncomfortable. And people prefer the comfort of stability, even if it means complacency to the discomfort of, of, of creativity. So Salman Rushdie, the great novelist said that creativity is sort of at the boundary between what's safe and the cliff, like the precipice, right? And in order to be a creative person, in order to even be a creative employee, you're questioning things. And in order to question, that means that you have to allow yourself to not know and lots of times individuals or organizations would prefer to know or be in control. We have this strong, it's interesting as human beings, we have this strong propensity to want to be super in control, which is wonderful. And it's actually for our survival. But the downside is it doesn't allow us to be more open that we're just temporarily not going to know. So Wisława Szymborska, the great Polish poet, when she won the Nobel, uh, the Nobel for her work, said the job of the poet is to say, I don't know, and to keep on going. Now, most people don't keep on going. And it's easy to then say, oh, I don't like you, the whistleblower, because you're making me think about something that I'd rather not. <laughs> That's why the, the, the best whistleblowers or the best people who um, create new innovations do so in a way that can also be digested, right? You can, um, I wanna play you a little clip here. Um, of, of music. Before you do speak. that, I wanted a comment. Yeah, so, go for it. Rabbi had said that, and, and Julie had said, it just depends on, we have to learn how to speak to particular audiences. So I have to measure what I'm saying. And a whistleblower, even if they say things very well and in a measured way, a lot of times everyone's so glad then they can attack the whistleblower because it's me, not me. Not me, I didn't do it with them. And so right. then they don't want to support the whistleblower. They hope the whistleblower does it on their own. So one of the key elements in an organization, if you can reframe um, the whole story of a whistleblower to a new leader or an mm -hmm. emerging thread in improvisation. And I yeah. love that language. And, and Rabbi, you and I can work on other ways to give people practical ways to get that. All right, back to you. You, you want to hear something to blow your mind, Dr. Retschew? You already blew my mind. I want to hear more. Yes. As a good Catholic, I hope this doesn't offend you, but Jesus was the best whistleblower there was. Yes. Right. If you think about it, one of the reasons that, that what he did was revolutionary was call to account what the Pharisees were doing and what was going on in the society. 
And in fact, what's interesting too, is that he looked at the marginalized completely. And he said, let the one who is free from sin cast the first stone to say, none of us are impervious. None of us are immune from doing wrong. That's what makes us human. But instead of saying you are now exiled, it says now we can make a space for you because there's a path back. That's the creative path. And so it's hard because the whistleblower is like the prophet in the Jewish uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel wrote this beautiful book on the prophets, and he talks about the, being a prophet is seeing something in the society that's not seen yet, and you're calling account, but you're largely alone because you're not in the majority view. And the, the goal is to give people the skills to see and behave in such a way so they don't sacrifice the whistleblower. Of course, because it's easier to, again, scapegoat something that is too different and difficult to assimilate it's scary the, but it's also back, just lack of skill yeah when you go back to the, the issue of change uh you know it makes a great campaign slogan but as my wife likes to say the only thing that really likes to change is a baby's diaper <laughs> <laughs> we, we are, true. you know this is this is why you have the lemming effect because yeah. we can all talk about how much we want change but really we want things to stay the same and we mentioned before that, that in, in Hebrew, the word for rebuke has the same root as the word for validation. Mm. Because when I rebuke you, what I'm saying is I trust in you that you have the ability to do better. And mm. the sages say, love rebuke. Well, how much of us love rebuke? And it's, it's our egos are on the line and it's uncomfortable. And we have to reevaluate. We're going to have to admit we were wrong. But that's the only way progress happens. And I often like to say, what would I rather have happen? Would I rather recognize that I'm wrong so I can correct what's wrong or persist in being wrong? One well, has short-term consequences. One has long-term consequences. We had Dr. Helen Turnbull on who addressed that issue. She said that we hire for diversity, but then train and lead for the same so yeah. we've hired a, a people with diverse backgrounds diverse knowledge diverse ways of thinking and then somehow we don't continue to reward them so we default back to somehow that person's the problem we don't want to hear what they say we vilify them we crucify them end of story it's fascinating how and that's, the, that's where the inside job helps because the more that we're yes. connected to understanding the the part of ourselves that can't be a whistleblower inside the more we get comfortable with being curious about it and the more we can be curious and compassionate Rumi has this great poem called the guest house and he says you know this being human is a guest house and let let the the guest come in even if it messes up your house because it could be a guide from beyond and what we don't know yet might be something that gives us something really interesting. The organizations I've seen that are the most innovative are the ones that get excited about change and then the implementation and then the part people forget, the measurement of the impact of that implementation, and then the next group of what can we do even better. So they don't see it as an end, they see it as the beginning of the next Coltrane riff, right? It's like and a I, writer. A writer is yeah. constantly interesting and revising. Yeah. And they know that the revision process makes makes more interesting things happen and then new things emerge that add to it. And sometimes and not, they subtract from it. And not to see it as failure, but to see it as part of the process. That's that's brilliant. I love your Coltrane thing. Thank you. Yeah. And I have a special surprise for you, Dr. Gurry. Uh, so I know the story about the red shoes. And I wanted to share with you a story of another special woman who also appreciated red shoes. So there's this wonderful story of a young woman who had polio when she was a child. And then when she was a teenager, she was in a terrible bus accident. And all her life, she struggled with pain. Um, and unfortunately, later in life, uh, she, she had, like I said, she had polio, she had this accident. And when she was, in, I think in her mid thirties, she had to have her leg amputated oh. because of gangrene. And, but ever, the person to kind of keep connected to her creativity and her spunk and her spirit, she decided that when she was going to have a prosthetic made, that it was going to have a red boot. Ay, que lindo. And do you know who this woman was? No. 
painter Frida Kahlo. Really? Yeah. And I think what it says to us, and I think what we're talking about here today too, is that we don't want to lose a connection to our brilliance, whether it's the coat of many colors or our red shoe or our red boots, right? But that we want to celebrate what is individually unique about us. And despite the fact, I love that story of leaving Cuba, despite the fact that we're leaving something, we are not losing our dignity, our value and our purpose. Can I that get an amen? Uh, amen. <laughs> I'll give you a, a Catholic and non-denominational am. Amen. <laughs> I think I think that's wonderful. What a what a lovely gift. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I didn't know she had that red shoe. And if you look at her paintings, uh, George Bonanno is a, a, a Columbia researcher on trauma, and he writes this beautiful story about her that you see in her work. Her incorporating her challenges into her work. She's this beautiful image of her with a column. And it's really the brace that holds her body together that she's made yeah. into art. So how we can take suffering and turn it into beauty and art is also part of the way that we don't lose connection to the good stuff. I think that's good advice for anyone. And your sister has something to offer. She says, true, Dr. Red Shoe, important to keep the momentum throughout the change from implementation through the measurement of the change. And you can't be afraid of failure because that is one of the juicy secrets for creativity. As my father would say, Mijita, that was a spectacular failure. Congratulations. What can you do now? What did you learn? And we would often start by, you know, my father being the Freudian analyst was just also a really funny, funny guy. He would say, who made a bigger mistake today? Anyone make, do anything better? You know, like, oh, me, me, you know, it's, it's the attitude that you take. So that was, that was very brilliant. Thank you. Well, Rabbi, do you have a brilliant word of the day for us? Because I think we could talk forever and ever with this guy. Well, I, I happened upon a word of the day um, this morning. Um, I don't know whether I should admit or not that I found it on TikTok. Uh, oh, do it, admitting. Uh, do it, yeah. You can find all sorts of things in all sorts of strange places. Um, but the word that I never heard of, which I actually had wondered about, is the word is smesis, smesis. And that is when you insert a word into the middle of another word. Now, this is not so common in English. Apparently, it was quite common in, in Greek, in, uh, uh, in, in Latin, and it works well in the structure of Dutch and German. Uh, so, for instance, one of the most common places you hear it in English is people will say, well, that's a whole nother story, which uh, always struck me as sort of a distortion of language, but it's actually a, a linguistic device. You're splitting up the word another and you're putting whole in the middle. Um, sometimes you'll hear people do it with phrases like, uh, that's unbloody believable, even though they may use a different <laughs> word for bloody. Um, and apparently, not that I've never, I've never seen a, an episode of The Simpsons, but apparently there's a character there named Ned Flanders who says, says things like, uh, well, diddly elkum. <laughs> the idea is that when we interrupt the natural flow of our ideas, that brings extra attention to the content. And in our discussion about looking deeply, looking inside, the value of and the, the advantage of introverts is that introverts have a natural tendency to look and think deeper, to notice subtlety and nuance. They have less fear of silence, and they're often more attuned to new ways of thinking and seeing because they don't get caught up in the relentless rhythm of life. We, 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 we can easily become lemmings, just following the crowd, following the course we're on, because we don't have to think about it so much. But to slow down, to read between the lines, to look beneath the surface, to think more deeply, to contemplate, to reevaluate, you know, these are the behaviors that can really enrich our lives and can really deepen our connection with other people. Wow, Rabbi, as usual, nailed it. 
So, you Michael, thank you. Inspired? Oh, go ahead. <laughs> thank you. Uh, it's been a pleasure, and uh, your, your, the wealth of your wisdom and your, and your insights has been truly inspiring to you. Do you have a final thought you'd like to leave us with? Well, I'm just delighted because now I know what happens when you bring a rabbi and a shrink together. I was waiting <laughs> for what it would be like, and now I know. Uh, I, I, I think, you know, the beautiful part is how we can court creativity and enjoy the mystery. And as Rilke said, to embrace the questions, knowing that if we delve into them, we will find the answers and they will be ours. Beautiful, thank you. Doctor, what's the last word? Well, the last word is two things. First is choose the people you hang with wisely. And I think Rabbi, we have done very well today. Um, I think that one of the secrets of the universe is to love ourselves enough to have lovely human beings all around us. And if there's someone that's less than lovely, find a way to honor them from a distance or let others honor them. You can take a pass. <laughs> um, and not worry about saying bad things to people. I think because of the cancel culture, whatever the rabbi and I were talking about in another episode. So one of the things I'm going to leave everyone with is ethics. They're all around you. The next time you stumble or you see someone else stumble, whether you get angry or scared or whatever is the feeling, have the faith that Dr. Michael Alsey was talking about. Love yourself. Know yourself. Ask yourself, why am I angry? What's going on? What's the right thing to do? And I think that love those stumbles. And, you know, we're stumbling a lot these days with all of the, the changes uh, in policy and in our lives because of COVID and the next variants going on and on. So get excited the next time you're annoyed, frustrated, scared, or irritated, because that is the secret source of maybe enough courage and curiosity to let yourself shine. Those are my thoughts. Well, thank you gentlemen for being um, here on The Rabbi and the Shrink. For questions, send it to podcast at The Rabbi and the Shrink. And if you go to um, uh, Michael Alsey's uh, website.com and he's all over the internet, we'll make sure to have all the links everywhere. Uh, we'll put links to his TED talk and uh, you can, I try to order his book. It's, it's on pre-order. You can order it uh, on Amazon. Everyone take care. We'll see you on another episode of The Rabbi and the Shrink. Be well. Bye.